from Psalm 46. This psalm has been significant. Um, Darlene, you and I were talking yesterday that it's been six months that we've been in the, the COVID thing, really, a uh, solid six months now. And uh, right at the beginning, the Lord, the Lord put Psalm 46 on my heart, and uh, I know on the hearts of others. And uh, it's really been significant. Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. There's a declaration here. Uh, even though we will not fear, even though we will not fear. And I'm not saying we don't take precautions. We are today. We're, uh, we're being COVID sensitive. And I think throughout life, we generally understand that. But we don't have to be moved by fear because of something very significant. Verse 4, there's a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. The difference maker, the difference maker is verse 5, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. That's big. I want you to understand that, you know, there's all kinds of all kinds of things that we can rely on, we can rest on, we can say, well, this'll this'll help me, that'll help me. And maybe in some measure we say they do. But verse five is the difference maker. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. And that promise, that prophetic declaration, is fulfilled in Christ. In him, we are blessed with every blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In him we have redemption through his blood. In him we have forgiveness from our sins. In him we are we're predestined to, to accord to be adopted as sons and daughters. In him we have all these things. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. Let's rejoice, saints. It says God shall help her just at the break of dawn. Oh, I love that. Just at the break of dawn, just when you need them. Let's rejoice in the Lord today.
God, it's our joy to worship you this morning just for all you've done for us, for all that you are. It is our honor. We love to worship you. We love to sing to you, God. 
We just ask that in our every moment of every day that our, our song would be you, God. That the song on our lips would be of you, of the mercies you've given us, of the grace that we've received. God, we want to live for you. We want to live to glorify you, to seek first your kingdom. glorify you in all that we do, God. There's a song in my soul and I feel the stirring in me This I know for sure That your love is like a flood And your mercy never ends I give song to you. There's a joy. There's a joy in my soul. It rises like the morning. This I know for sure. That your grace is enough. And your promise never breaking. so much.
We have been so blessed, uh, Gabe, with your ministry uh, off and on for the last few months and uh, all the folks who've been coming over and just helping out uh, with the ministry. It's really, it's really actually very, very rich and so uh, uh, really, really very, very encouraging. So it's great to see all of you and uh, uh, for those who are with us by Facebook Live, either live or maybe watching the recorded version, great to have you as well. You know, um, the Lord really is, is, is on the move. I want to, if you have your Bible, open to the book of Revelation. I, uh, that kind of settle in for a minute. I mean, that just like eclipses all of the stuff that like overcomes our minds. Uh, that is really unbelievable. And then it says this, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So what we have in verses four and five, first half of five, is this revelation of God and revelation of the glory of God, the spirit of God at work, Jesus Christ and the redemptive work that he's done. And then he, he pivots and in a sense, part of his exaltation of the Lord is seen through the lens, through the prism of what he's done for us. Verse five, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins, in his own blood. The focus isn't on us, the focus is on him through what he's done for us. The goodness he has bestowed upon us, that he has lavished upon us in Christ, tells us about his majesty. You know, in verse, in verse four, we, we have this declaration for him who is and was and who is to come, and that, that'll like, that'll, that, that blows your mind. I mean, that's like, wow. But then as he gets down onto a very personal level, he says, and look what he's done for us. What does that tell you about him? He loved us, washed us from our own sins in his own blood, and has made us, look at verse six, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. You know, as we were worshiping this morning and gave thanks again for leading us, um, I just, I, you know what, I had this thought, I had this thought, and I don't know if it was because we watched a movie last night with uh, some of the grandchildren, it was kind of fun. Um, but I had this thought in my head that we're so often preoccupied with wanting to become our, the perfect version of us. In other words, we're tripping over ourselves, we're, we're struggling with our own weaknesses, and I understand that, but look what he's done. He's taking, taken imperfect people and he's washed them. He's taken imperfect people, broken people, he's made them kings and priests. In other words, we are qualified today. I want you to see this right now. It's just, it's absolutely amazing because I think sometimes we think, well, if I, if I can just get a little better, I'll be qualified. In Christ, 
We are made kings. We have authority. We can come before the living God and minister the praises of his glory today. He's made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. In some ways, uh, John the Revelator says after that, he says, let's have church. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's lift up a shout to the Lord is really what he says. If you look ahead then to chapter 5, he, he records here the, uh, the song, the song of the, of, of the saints. Verse 8. Now when he had taken the scroll, speaking of Jesus, the Lamb, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you are slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Again, the focus here is on him, but the focus is on him through the absolutely amazing work he's done. You know, when we look at the, the glory of God in the scriptures, we certainly see his glory revealed in his creation. We see the glory of God in, in what, he has, what he has fashioned. I don't know about you, but I, I, I tend to look out certainly at the, at, on the horizontal level, you know, the, the plants, the trees, the mountains, the hills, the valleys, the rivers, the chasms, and I'm like, wow. I tend, when I then look up, last night on the way out, uh, we were leaving the Paladin home where we celebrated a birthday for Aubrey. Um, I looked out, it was a very clear night, and I was just like, just took a glimpse at the stars. I was like, whoa, absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. And then toward the, toward the western sky, there was a, a, a large planet. I'm assuming it was Jupiter. Um, and uh, I was like, wow, this is, this is amazing. We see the glory of God in all he's fashioned here. But we see the glory of God in what he's redeemed to himself. In other words, he not only can make something, but he can take something broken and he can make it beautiful again. Think about that for a second. He doesn't just create the thing, but he redeems the thing after it is hopelessly smashed. Think about that for a second. Stradivarius made great violins, but if you took one of his violins and you smashed it, Stradivarius would probably say, gotta start over. The Lord our God takes broken violins and he refashions them, refurbishes them, so that in the end, the finished product is greater than the former. Because we have a song that the angels cannot sing. You know what that song is? I've been redeemed. Angels can't proclaim that. They can proclaim the glory of God, but they cannot proclaim the song that you and I proclaim, and that is, I've been redeemed. Sin smashed and ruined and defiled every part of humanity. But Jesus Christ has come to redeem, to make us kings and priests to our God. That is our God. I want you to just take a moment right now, and I want you to reflect on the absolute majesty of a God who loved us and washed us from our own sins in his own blood and has then made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Oh God, Lord, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. Forever, oh God, we will sing the anthem of your praise and your glory. And even now, oh God, the Spirit is drawing us, drawing us to to live our lives in absolute emptying of self and living for your purposes, giving ourselves to the one who loved us and washed us from our sins. Lord, thank you for what you've done. Lord, I, I pray today that in the light of your holiness and your glory, 
Lord, I pray that uh, the attack on the, on, on the mind of the saints would be broken today. Lord, the attack of, of, of disqualification. Lord, I pray that that thing would be broken, O oh God. Father, I pray today, O oh God, that you would, you would remind us that it was, it was your love on purpose lavished upon us that you washed us from our sins and your own blood and you've made us kings and priests to our God. And Lord, we would take our place with the multitude from every tribe, every tongue, every people, and every nation proclaiming you have redeemed us to God by your blood and we shall reign on the earth. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Amen. Good. Amen. Well, saints, it is great to see you. Um, I don't know if there's anyone who has anything to share, would love to have uh, sharing. This mic is live, so you can uh, share. But if there is anybody, would love to have that. Any testimonies or just from your seat? Um, I'll just mention for a moment a few things coming up. Uh, by the way, uh, we, we want to thank Alan Daniels for coming this past Wednesday. Darlene and I were, were not able to make it, uh, but Alan came and, uh, and he shared some of his testimony, a really rich testimony of really uh, a lifetime of learning to hear the voice of God and uh, uh, really, really rich. So, uh, and I know a number of you made it out for that. Uh, we'll continue Wednesday nights. Um, two weeks from today, we're going to begin a, uh, a series, a 40-day campaign in the book of Acts, uh, Acts, the continuing story. And uh, so that'll include seven uh, Sunday mornings. We're going to be studying the book of Acts. In our Wednesday nights, uh, we'll go ahead during that time. We'll continue meeting uh, the guys here, the sisters over in the other room, and we'll look at the book of Acts in those times as well. So uh, beginning whatever that Sunday is, September 26th or 7th, uh, we'll start in that series on the book of Acts. I'm really excited about that. So that's going to be that's going to be real good. There will also be a daily devotion, so that uh, each day there'll be a, a portion of the reading of the book of Acts. So uh, uh, you'll get through that. <clears throat> excuse me, in the process of about 40 days. So uh, that'll be a great time. So, and I've got scheduled right now for Sunday, October 4th. That'll be the second week into that series. Um, Dr. Eldon Wilson's going to be here with us, so I'm looking forward to that. So uh, he'll be sharing, and uh, uh, I'll direct him toward the book of Acts, but give him some liberty as well. So he, might, he may or may not continue in the book of Acts that Sunday during the campaign. I'm sure he's got a message out of every book in the Bible, um, so we'll see what he has to share. But we're looking forward to that. Dr. Wilson is, how old is he now? Um, I don't know if he's 80, 89? 89, yep, okay, Nine, 90 uh, this coming April. Um, so, and he continues to go around serving the Lord. Um, uh, sadly, his international travel has been curtailed by COVID, um, but that didn't stop him from going cross country again this year. Um, he drove, I don't know how many thousands of miles he reported on Facebook, was it 14,000? And uh, I know I just talked to Armand Davchan, a, uh, uh, an Armenian brother who's now in, in the Los Angeles area. Doc was out there this summer, uh, spent time with Armand and uh, uh, just out preaching and going wherever. And uh, so the Lord's sustaining him and he's been a blessing to the churches. So we're looking forward to having him on October 4th. Um, Darlene and I are continuing to do the Facebook Live each morning uh, for about 20 minutes or so. Uh, we have a hard time. We tend to get a little long-winded. Sorry, um, uh, it, but there's exciting stuff when we look at the Bible. It's just it's hard to stop after you know seven. I see 17 minutes, 18 minutes, and I think, oh, we need to wrap it up. And then 10 minutes later, we need to wrap it up. <laughs> um, so uh, we we try to keep it short, but it's been very very good. And what we're doing now is we're kind of in theme with where we are here on Sunday mornings as we get into 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and the gifts of the Spirit, we've, we've been looking at that. And that really is gonna continue to be a theme through the, book of, through the book of Acts as we get involved in that series. Because when you look at the book of Acts, and we'll talk about this more as we go, get into it, but as you look at the book of Acts, sometimes the book of Acts is referred to as the Acts of the Apostles. 
Other times, it's referred to as the Acts of the Holy Spirit because the author of the book of Acts, Luke, who also wrote the Gospel of Luke, one of the things he focuses on in both the Gospel and the book of Acts is the Holy Spirit in operation, the Holy Spirit moving, the Holy Spirit moving in the life and ministry of Jesus in the, in the Gospel, and then the Holy Spirit continuing to move in the church. And we're calling it Acts the Continuing Story because you and I are the continuation of the book of Acts. The things God did in Acts chapters 1 through 28, he wants to continue doing in our day today until Jesus comes in his fullness. So uh, that's going to be an exciting series and really a, a real focus of that is on the, uh, on the work of the Holy Spirit. So anything else I need to mention by way of announcement, events, or uh, does anybody have anything they want to share this morning? All right, well, I'll tell you what then. We're going to receive an offering. If anyone is here and is prepared to uh, give and wants to uh, participate in the physical offering, I know there are other ways to give. Uh, Darlene and I tend to give online, uh, and, I, and there is a mobile app. If you want to give on the mobile app, I know a lot of you mail in checks, uh, things like that. But we'll receive an offering now. And I, used, I like to use this as an opportunity to remind us um, that God really does recognize as we lay our time, our talents, and our treasures before him, it really is significant to him. And we think, well, what, what does it matter? You know, to the God who, who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, uh, what, what, does it, what does it really, what difference does it make? What does our, the offering of our mere lives uh, uh, have, have, what difference does it make to him? Saints, he has fashioned us with the capacity to respond to his love. I want you to think about that for a moment. He has created us with the capacity to respond to his love. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. Our response matters to God, just as his love matters to us. Somehow, our response matters to him. Um, I read a book a few years ago, a very interesting book called The Most Moved Mover. And the title of the book was, in a sense, borrowed and kind of ad adapted uh, from something that is part of a Aristotelian philosophy, and that is a vision of a God who is the unmoved mover, a God who moves all of creation, but himself is completely unmoved or unaffected by creation. And that was a, that was a picture, a conception of God uh, in ancient Greece. And this book basically asserted the idea that the God of the Bible is not the unmoved mover, but he is the most moved mover. That somehow the heart of God is touched by our response to his love. We respond in many, many ways, but ultimately in the giving of our time, our talents, our treasures, our very selves. Let's this morning, as we participate in the offering, let's give our very selves to God, responding to his love in a fresh way. Father, I come before you and I thank you. In a sense, every day is a day for rededication. Every day is a day to freshly say, Jesus, I give my life to you. Jesus, come into my life. It belongs to you. Every day is a day to respond to your love. And so God, I do pray that you would, you would be glorified today, that you would be honored. Lord, I know that somehow it's hard for us to conceptualize it, hard to, hard to comprehend somehow the heart of God being moved. And yet we know that there are ways in which we can grieve the Holy Spirit. In like manner, there are ways in which we, we bring joy to your heart. And Lord, I thank you for that. That somehow even our, our gifts, financial gifts, are, a, are a, a sweet offering to you. Sweet sacrifice, an aroma, pleasing. Pleasing to you. Lord, I thank you. And Lord, I pray 
that the relationship we have with you would be like, like a symphony, an antiphonal call and response of love calling to love, calling to love, calling to love. Lord, that the love you've lavished upon us, having, in a sense, wooed us and calling us then to respond to that love with love itself, Lord, I pray that it would just echo back and forth. Our lives would be lived as a symphony of love lived in relationship with you. Amen. Amen. Chris, if you could uh, receive the offering from anyone who wants to uh, provide something this morning. Amen. Good. Well, let's, uh, let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12. Corinth and only share like some of the some of the stuff he shared the whole thing and he said as a matter of fact I think it's in verse 7 in chapter 1 he says so that you come sh you, you fall short in no gift no and the, and the word there the Greek word is charisma in other words there's no grace that hasn't been poured out upon you so for all their problems they had problems with division they had problems with you know with uh, maybe just not being sensitive to one another we we read about problems participating in the Lord's Supper and maybe people getting drunk at the Lord's Supper and other people not having anything to partake of and, and different problems. For all their problems, there were some really great things happening in the church at Corinth. In some ways, uh, this, was a, this really was a, a, a move of God. There was a move of God in Corinth and the Holy Spirit had signaled that to Paul uh, and we read about that in the book of Acts. I have many people in that city and so Paul stayed there and and from what we understand historically, the church was somewhere between 40 people and maybe 150, which uh, may not sound big to us, but actually for, for New Testament times in the churches around the Mediterranean, that was actually a very, very significant work. And so they had a lot going on. One of the things they had going on in a very positive sense was that they understood that the work of the Holy Spirit was for all believers. They understood the... Holy Spirit touching their lives, filling their lives, and using them in giftings. That the miraculous signs of Jesus and then through the apostles were for all believers, and they were, they were, they were operating in those. And so Paul actually spends three chapters, which is a lot of New Testament real estate, if you think about it. Um, three full chapters, chapters 12, 13, and 14, he's talking about the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in their midst. It's really very, very significant. Um, I kind of challenge you right now to think about three chapters, three consecutive chapters anywhere in the New Testament that talk about one particular topic as significantly as this. In other words, it really is quite amazing. And so the Apostle Paul lays out a, a it's almost like a, like, a, like a graduate level seminar on the operation of the Holy Spirit and he's encouraging them, he's instructing them, and in some ways he's, he's building them up because this is significant stuff. Now, look at verse chap, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. 
Uh, another translation says, now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. I want you to be fully, fully equipped. I want you to be fully knowledgeable. I want you to be fully operational. I want, I want this stuff to be happening in your midst. Uh, I don't know if you know the name John Wimber. John Wimber uh, passed away a few years ago. John Wimber uh, was instrumental in the establishing of the Vineyard Church movement. Um, and uh, and uh, really uh, just did, did some great things. God, God used him in some tremendous ways. Um, and John Wimber was involved in uh, rock and roll um, back in, and he got saved in, I think it was 1963. Uh, check on Wikipedia for the actual date. But he got saved early on in the Jesus movement. He got saved out of uh, a lifestyle of rock and roll, drugs, alcohol. And so he gets saved. Uh, he's following Jesus. He gets involved in a, a you know, a kind of a, a, a good church, uh, but he's going to Bible studies. He's hungry for the Word of God, and he's, he's studying the Word of God, and he's recognizing there's a gap between what's happening at the church he's going to and what he's seeing in the Bible. And so as a, as a young believer in the, uh, the mid-1960s, he's looking at his Bible, and he's seeing, seeing what Jesus is living out. Jesus, you know, signs and wonders and miracles. And then in the book of Acts, we're reading about signs and wonders and miracles. I mean, God's on the move. And he's looking at his church, and he's like, there's a gap here. So he says to one of his leaders, it's kind of a fam famous line. He says to him, when do we get to do the stuff? And the guy says, well, what do you mean the stuff? <laughs> what do you mean the stuff? He says, well, you know, the, the miracles and the healing and, you know, blind eyes opening and people being raised from the dead, the stuff. And the leader said to him, well, we don't do that anymore. That was for back then. And John Wimber's response, I have gave up drugs for this? <laughs> He said, no, he says, I want to do the stuff. <laughs> and that hunger in him was birthed from the word of God and the spirit of God. And he pursued that. And later on, he got to do the stuff. I was at a meeting, uh, went to a conference, Dar, I'm not sure, maybe you, you came. Uh, there was a conference in Hempstead, Long Island. Um, I, I didn't go to that. Okay. You accompanied me on the journey, maybe visited with my mom. Um, but I went to a conference and John Wimber spoke and it was, uh, it was a great meeting and God, uh, you know, what a great brother and God was using him and it was just, just wonderful. And uh, for many, many years, John Wimber got to do the stuff. And I, wanna, I want you to get a, catch a picture here of something. So Jesus, you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You can't read those accounts of Jesus' life without recognizing there's something otherworldly going on. He did the stuff. I mean, you can't read those without saying, wow. And the people around him were like, wow. The hand of God is at work here. Signs, wonders, miracles, words of knowledge, words of wisdom. I mean, it's just like, absolutely amazing you know need some tax money go fishing check the fish's mouth <laughs> i mean amazing haven't haven't caught any fish throw your seasoned sailors throw your net on the other side really like the side of the boat matters really and they throw the net on the other side and up comes this great draft of fishes and everybody's like Wow, oh, this is amazing. A big question, though, think about it. As you get into Acts chapter 1, is, okay, Jesus has now ascended to heaven. What's it going to be like for his followers? There's a question mark about what life for his followers are going to be like. Were the, were the signs and wonders unique to Jesus? It's a really good question. Now, you and I assume the answer to that because we've read the book of Acts, and so we know the answer, and the answer is it wasn't unique to Jesus, and in fact, what was in Jesus 
in the fullness of grace is then sprinkled upon his followers. We see the apostles. We see that, that first generation of believers moving in the signs and wonders. We don't really get very far in the book of Acts before there is a miracle of healing. Acts chapter 3, Peter and John on the way to the prayer meeting, and there's a lame man. There's a question mark at that point. If you haven't read the rest of the book, there's a question mark about what are they going to do? Just give him some food money? That, that would be valid. That would be good. But what we see is Peter looks down and he says, silver and gold I don't have. I, ca I can't give you some money right now, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Takes the man by the hand, lifts him up, and the man is miraculously healed. And it begins. And so we see this first generation of believers who are now hearing, you know, they were in Jesus' presence, and the stuff is following them. But there's another big question mark. What about the ones who hear from them? Will the signs and wonders transfer to the next generation? That's a, that's a valid question. If you haven't read the book, you don't know the answer. I think most of you have probably read the book, so you, you're anticipating the answer. But if you haven't read the book, it's really a very good question. Should the stuff continue? Should, should that empowerment continue? It turns out it absolutely does. And the signs and wonders that were on Jesus that then are visible in the lives of the apostles and that first group of believers then is starting to work out in the lives of those who heard from them. In other words, the next generation of believers is actually moving in the signs and wonders. It's absolutely amazing. I love one particular passage which talks about Philip the evangelist. He has four daughters. And you know what it says about them? Four daughters which prophesied. I always liked that one. I have a lot of daughters. You know, I, I, you know, I wondered. I, at the time I first noticed that in the Bible, I had three daughters and one son. I said, maybe I'll have a fourth daughter and they'll all, they'll all prophesy. You know, I, I love that. What you have is generations moving on. And Peter actually proclaimed that in his message in Acts chapter 2. If you will repent, if you'll believe in Jesus, if you'll repent and be baptized, you too will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off. In other words, that which was on Jesus in fullness of grace now fills the lives of the first century believers, but it continues into the lives of those who follow after them. In other words, it's a, it's a perpetual thing until Jesus comes again. And so Paul is now talking to here about believers in Corinth. They don't get saved. They don't hear the gospel until 20 years after the ascension. They are removed in space and time from the epicenter of the, of the birth of the church, the activities in and around Jerusalem and the, and, and the nation of Israel, the land of Israel. They're 20 years removed and hundreds of miles away. So the question is, will this stuff continue in their lives? And Paul in chapter 1 says, actually, you come behind in no gift. And you got the whole thing. You, I mean, everything I have, I gave to you. Uh, there, there it is, you have it. And so we have this sense in which, this is exciting. And so he spends now three chapters encouraging the saints in the fact that the Holy Spirit is at work in their lives. The Holy Spirit wants to fill them. The Holy Spirit wants to use them in dynamic ways that will encourage all of us in the things of God. Now, what we see in Jesus, the fullness of grace upon him, is then, I'll say, parceled out, sprinkled out, spread out in the body of Christ. Now, he moved in all these gifts. You might move in some of them. He moved in like, like without measure. You might move in measure. You know what I pray for? More gifts and more measure. Maybe it's not going to be complete. You know, Paul, we're going to look at the nine gifts of the Spirit, at least an overview today. Maybe I won't move in all nine gifts, and maybe I won't move in them all the time. But you know what I pray for? 
more and more, more and more. And whatever the need is, Lord, if somebody's sick, I think I know which gift I want to move in. <laughs> you know which one they need? They need healing. I, I want to move in whatever the need is, Lord, to meet the need of people around me. And so the Apostle Paul is, in a sense, he's saying, let's, let's get excited about this. Saints, it's happening. It's happening then. It's happening today. The operation of the Holy Spirit. And it builds us. Think about what happened when Jesus moved in signs and wonders, words of knowledge, words of wisdom. People stepped back and said, there's, there's something going on here. One of the ones I love, the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Okay? There's no physical miracle. There's no, no, nobody, you know, who's lame walks. He simply says to her, go get your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. And he says, that's right. He said, you've had five husbands. The man you're with now isn't your husband. She's like, how'd you know that? How'd you know that? You know, sometimes when we're, Sometimes when we're really lost, we try to cover our tracks the best we can. And you can hide from people, but you can't hide from God. <laughs> and so Jesus gets this download, and she runs to the people in the town, and she, she says, come meet a man who told me everything. He read my mail. In other words, there's an operation of what we now recognize as the word of knowledge through Jesus. And she's like, this, 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 this is, this is amazing. When God moves in dynamic ways through the power of the Holy Spirit, it, number one, gets our attention. Number two, it signals to us that God is in the midst. And for those who are following Christ, it builds us in faith. It builds us in faith. When I see, when I see God move, saints, I am, I am encouraged by that. I'm encouraged. Because the, the Christian life, is it can be a long journey. It can be a long journey. There, you know, we, we have been waiting now almost 2,000 years for Jesus to come back. It's a long journey. It's arduous at times. The Holy Spirit is meant to comfort us in the journey. The expressions, the, the almost tangible expressions of the move of God in dramatic ways are meant to comfort and encourage us as we walk out the Christian life so that we do not lose heart. And the Holy Spirit wants to be active. And the Apostle Paul spends three chapters now encouraging the church at Corinth. Again, they've got all kinds of problems. There's issues. He's had to correct them. But he's basically saying, I want you to get this one. I want you to get this one real good. This is really important. So he starts by saying about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. Now, this chapter is a fantastic chapter, a lot in it. We'll just kind of touch the, the highlights of the first section right now. But I want you to, in a sense, get excited today about more of the Holy Spirit. Let's read now verses 1 through 11 in chapter 12. Now, with an introduction like that, I'm going to have to be careful. What's, <laughs> I'm in trouble, that's right. Um, either that or you're in trouble. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking at the clock. I don't have my glasses on, so I can't see it. Let's not worry about it. Um, chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles, carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And I want to start by saying, he's basically saying that the operation of the Spirit, the, the moving of the gifts of the Spirit need a biblical foundation. They need to be shepherded. That's really what he's saying. In other words, let's, let's understand here that not everything that is purported to be a move of the Spirit is a move of the Spirit. In other words, if somebody stands up and says, you know, Jesus is accursed, thus saith the Holy Spirit, Jesus is accursed. You're not going to get invited back. That, that's right. <laughs> you'll get corrected. You might get invited back, but you'll get corrected. Um, in other words, he's basically saying not everything that's purported to be a move of the Spirit is indeed the Spirit. So he's, he's right away saying this thing needs to be received in the right package. Somebody can stand up and say, well, God told me. Well, you know what? Sometimes I say to them, well, God told me different. And I, I, have, it in, I have it in black and white right here. Um, and so 
He's, he's basically saying, let's receive this in the context in which we have to. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Verse 4, 5, and 6, fantastic verses. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. <clears throat> there are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. First of all, he says, we've got to receive these gifts in a package of humility where these things need to be tested, something that's purported to be the Spirit. Let's test it by the Word of God. Let's test it by confirmation. And the second thing he says is, these gifts are not meant to bring division to the body of Christ, but in fact, they're meant to call us together in unity. Now, we might move differently. You might move in a gift that I don't really move in. You might move in a gift that I move in, but you might move in it in a different measure than me. When he talks about these things, there are diversities of gifts, differences of ministries, diversities of activities. Verse 6, the diversities of activities, the word there is kind of a, it's kind of a vague word when it says activities in the, in the New King James. What it really almost means is differences of measure. You know, there's preaching and there's preaching. Okay? Um, there's somebody can prophesy and somebody can prophesy, and it's not the same. Um, there are different emphases. What happens whenever we see differences of giftings, differences of measures in the body of Christ? What can happen to us? I feel left out. You know, uh, you have a gift I don't. I don't have. You're moving in something I'm not moving in. You're you're moving in it, and it seems to have <clears throat> greater punch than when I move in it. Um, and I and I, and I feel I feel left out on the other side. Whew, when I move in the gift. A lot happens. What happens on the other side? Well, I have a gift they don't have. We get prideful. And he's basically saying, saints, we've got to deal with a couple of things up front. First of all, got to take these gifts with the right package. Got to be tested in the context of the word of God. But secondly, we cannot let the operation of the Holy Spirit bring division. We can't let it be an ego thing. We can't let it challenge our sense of belonging, our sense of do I fit, nor can we let it become a pride thing. In other words, so he, th this is kind of in seed form. He unpacks it later on as he gets into the imagery of the body, which he begins in verse 12. We'll probably look at that next week. But I want to I want to give this to you because he gives it in seed form. It's almost like before he gets into the stuff, what he says is, now before I give this to you, you have to understand a couple of things. I'm working with one of my grandsons to prepare him for hunting. And uh, that's been a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, you know, so we're out and we're practicing our shooting. And I've, you know, I've got my, uh, what is my gun? It's a 270 and I'm about to hand it to him. Now, before I hand it to him, what do I do? I give important instruction. I don't just give him the gun and say, hey, have at it. <laughs> have, have fun. Um, that's not how it goes. In other words, before I hand him the gun, I give him very important gun safety instructions. That's what the Apostle Paul does here. Before he, in a sense, says, now let's talk about the stuff, first gives really foundational, foundational instruction. We'll talk about that more next week because he comes back to it. So he gives some important instruction he talks about the stuff, and then in verse 12 and following, he comes back and kind of amplifies the instruction he gives in seed form here. I hope, that, hope that's making sense. So again, uh, verses, we'll read verses 3 through 6, and then we'll read about the stuff. Verses 3 through, seven, uh, three through 6. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Uh, we've got to guard these things and, and shepherd them. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. Then, starting in verse 7 through 11, he mentions what we refer to now as the nine gifts of the spirit. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom, through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge, through the same Spirit. To another, faith, by the same Spirit. 
to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So he talks about what we call the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. What are they? They're operations of the Holy Spirit in a, in a supernatural way that encourage us and those around us. They don't refer to what we might say are innate talents or innate abilities. They refer to things that cause us to say that was God. Uh, the Christian and Missionary Alliance Church uh, has on their website a very, very good definition of the gifts of the Spirit. They define it this way. Listen to this. Spiritual gifts are not innate natural talents like an ear for music or the ability to draw, but rather they are empowerments that the Holy Spirit gives to a believer to minister to the body in ways that were not possible by mere natural effort apart from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the owner and dispenser of the spiritual gifts. Every believer can expect the Holy Spirit to minister through him or her with spiritual gifts. It's really a very, very good definition. They're not innate natural talents like an ear for music or the ability to draw, but rather they are empowerments that the Holy Spirit gives to a believer to minister to the body. Now, all of us have what we would call innate or natural talents. Now, you might feel like um, you don't have as many as some people around you, or maybe you feel like uh, uh, you don't have a, as, as deep a reservoir of innate or natural talents, but all of us have some innate or natural talents. They're innate or natural talents. They're gifts that um, without coming to Christ, without being filled with the Holy Spirit, they're in operation in your life. Now, hopefully, if you're now a believer, uh, you've taken those innate natural talents and you've surrendered them to the Lord and you're using them for the purposes of God. Um, you know, I discovered when I was very young that I had a, a just an interest in music. Um, didn't understand it. I don't, I don't come from a musical family. Uh, Mom and dad hardly ever even played the radio. Um, uh, just didn't, didn't happen. Uh, all I knew was I just, there was something about music that captivated me. It wasn't so with my, with my siblings. I have one uncle who was a, uh, one of my father's brothers who's a, who was a drummer, and I know he left a pair of drumsticks at our home in Long Island. Uh, I'm not sure why he did, but somehow when I was probably four or five years old, I discovered drumsticks in the closet. And uh, I, I, I took those drumsticks, and uh, what's the, is, there, is it a hassock? You call it a hassock, the round thing that you put your feet up on? Um, that was not a hassock, that was a drum. Um, and I, I, I mean, I would just pound on that thing. I would just make music all the time as a young four or five year old uh, child, just, just had this interest in music. Whenever I saw a musical instrument, I would gravitate toward it. Now, I got saved at age 19, and I hope that I have, in a sense, in a way that honors the Lord, taken that musical innate talent and used it in a way that glorifies God, but I don't refer to it as a spiritual gift. It's an innate talent. It's a gift from heaven. But it's not like these gifts. These gifts are like, that was God. I have no ability in myself. I showed zero aptitude before I got saved in seeing anyone healed of anything. As a matter of fact, I probably brought misery to people. I mean, you know, you know I, I, I did not have the capacity to heal. But I've laid hands on the sick, and I've seen them healed. That's God. That's not Rick using Rick power, something that God gave me innately. That's God. Um, and so the spiritual gifts refer to, in a sense, those moments, those times when God works in absolutely amazing ways in a way that encourages all of our hearts. It touches people very personally, but encourages all of our hearts that God was on the move. Now, some things we need to know about these nine spiritual gifts. By the way, again, um, these are gifts that were in operation in Jesus. Uh, as you're doing study, by the way, I'll just mention 
The only two of these nine that I don't see in operation, or at least haven't found it yet, um, and I've looked and maybe you're familiar with it, the only two I haven't seen in operation in Jesus are tongues, speaking in tongues, and interpretation of tongues. The other seven are clearly in operation. I have some speculation, some hunch as to why that is. I won't get into it today because it's, it's Rick speculating and I'm not here in the pulpit to give you my speculations. Um, but the other seven are clearly in operation in Jesus. All nine are in operation in the New Testament in some measure or another. So we see these nine spiritual gifts. By the way, there are nine fruits of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, the number 9 is important when you're talking about the operation of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5 verses 22 and 23 gives us the nine fruits of the Spirit. What are they? Love, let me see if I can do them. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against such there's no law. You know what that means? There's no power on earth that can stop you from love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. So there are nine fruits of the Holy Spirit. In other words, the, the very character of Christ worked into us by the Spirit dwelling in us. But then there are nine gifts of the Spirit. They are word of wisdom, word of knowledge, uh, faith, miracles, healings, uh, prophecy, discerning of spirits, speaking with tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Wow, I got all nine. Uh, I thought I was going to need your help. So we have nine fruits, we have nine gifts. So that'll help you to remember them, uh, or at least try to remember them. What do we need to know about the spiritual gifts? Number one, there's their manifestations or evidences of God at work. Number two, we should have an attitude of expectation and anticipation for them. Not be passive, as in, eh, if God wants to move, he can, I guess. But actually, eagerly saying, I want this, I want this. To wake up in the morning, not just Sunday morning, but every morning and say, God, how might you move today? How might you move today at work? Can the spiritual gifts be in operation at work? Absolutely, at school, in the market, absolutely. Look at Jesus' life and ministry. Look at Peter and John. Um, you know, the first healing doesn't play, take place in church. It takes place as they're, as they're traveling to church. In other words, it's just, it's happening all the time. This sense of eager expectation. That's what John Wimber had. That's what I had. As I was reading, I had a similar thinking about it. I probably had a similar experience to John Wimber because I was, at a, I was part of a neighborhood Bible study. I, uh, I was part of an unchurch movement. Uh, in the Jesus movement days. And so I was part of a neighborhood, bi neighborhood Bible study. We didn't talk about spiritual gifts or anything like that, but I kept reading in my Bible about the stuff. And I remember like, well, what's this, what's this tongues thing? And I asked some people, and, and, and you know what they said to me? Because back then it was really, really very controversial. They said, well, you know, we don't like to talk about things that are divisive. And I thought to myself, I don't know if it's divisive, it's biblical. But nobody would talk to me about, about what it was about. And I said, but it's in here and I want it. It's in here and I want it. You know, God wants us to be aggressive, actively aggressive to lay a hold of the things of the kingdom of heaven. Think about evangelism for a moment. I'm sorry, I'm doing a lot of wandering today. Um, think about evangelism. You know, we don't, we don't think about evangelism and say, well, if it happens, it happens. Saints, we need to stir ourselves up. I want to be active. I want to look for the person that I get to share Jesus with. Not just say, well, if it happens, it happens. But to be active and aggressive in pursuing the things of God. And so we need to be uh, uh, seeking God. 1 Corinthians 14.1 says, ask also for the special abilities the Holy Spirit gives. Ask. Chapter 12, verse 31 of 1 Corinthians. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. Okay, next thing we need to know. Spiritual gifts are meant to flow through all believers. Seasoned saints and new believers can all experience and be used in the spiritual gifts. You don't have to be a seasoned veteran to move in the gifts of the Spirit. You don't have, it doesn't have, you don't have to wait. You can actually be used by God Early on in your Christian life, ask for the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you, and then get ready. Get ready for what God's going to do. Saints who've been around a while, 
Maybe you have in your resume, oh yeah, I moved in God way back in ought to. Uh, you know, I, 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 moved in, yeah, I moved in God way back. Saints, it's time to say, resume aside, I need God today. So seasoned saints and new believers are meant to be operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We need to be fresh in it. None of us will be used in exactly the same way. Spiritual gifts build our faith, and the operation of the gift strengthens us all. And I want to talk about a couple this morning. I'll just take a couple more minutes on this to help us understand that these are not innate abilities. Now, some of the gifts, I think we would recognize that. Let's say healings. In other words, I, I think we would recognize that none of us has possesses, possesses in ourselves the capacity at all times to minister in healing. It's, it's something God might use us in. We, we look for those moments. We actually long for them. We pray for them. Um, but it's not that I have the ability to do that. Ford Reynolds, uh, who was an elder in the Madrid Church and then the Richfield Church for many years, he then pastored the Richfield Church for a number of years. God has used him tremendously in the gift of healing. But it's not everyone he's prayed for. In other words, God has used him at times. So it's not an innate ability, but it certainly is something God has used him in. I want to talk about the, the word of wisdom, the very first one that's listed in verse 8. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. Sometimes I think when we read that, we might think just wisdom. In other words, the Spirit of God gives wisdom, as in like, oh, that person, they just They've been around a while. They know life. They understand. They just, they make smart decisions. Thank God for people with that kind of gift and wisdom, but that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about a supernatural deposit of wisdom that you don't have by virtue of your years on earth or your ability to kind of navigate through the difficult terrain of life. In other words, it's wisdom that God deposits in a particular situation for a particular reason, and it brings glory to him. And I'll give you a perfect example. Early in the Gospel of Matthew, there are wise men who go following the star looking for the Messiah. And along the way, they come across Herod. Herod says, oh, um, tell you what, um, go find him and then come back and, you know, tell me where you found him. I'll worship him too. <laughs> so they go find him and they worship Jesus. They present the gifts, gold, frankincense, myrrh. And then they're warned by God in a dream to travel a different way. That's wisdom that's not deposited in them because they know the travelogue so well. They didn't get a new you know, set of triptychs from AAA saying it'd be better to take this route, save you some time, easier on the camels. That's not what happened. What happened was God was, he interjected himself in the situation. He gave them wisdom that they could not have known entirely what was going on? So God warns them in a supernatural word of wisdom, don't go that way. Don't go that way. I'll give you another example of a similar nature in the book of Acts, in the life of the apostle Paul. Paul has received this magnificent commission to preach the gospel, and he runs with it. You know what he says later on in the book of Acts? He says, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. God called me to preach the gospel. He called me to preach the gospel before kings and those in authority. He called me to go to the Gentiles, and I have not been disobedient. I have obeyed the call of God. And we see the e eagerness in his pursuit of fulfilling this call because he's going everywhere he can to preach the gospel. But in Acts chapter 16, something very interesting happened. Paul's trying to go to Asia to preach the gospel. And you know what it says? It's really kind of interesting. The Holy Spirit stops him. I, 
would imagine that would be a bit of a crisis for most of us. Oh, wait a minute, Lord, you told me to go, but now you're stopping me. So he says, okay, I get the message, don't go to Asia. I'll go to Bithynia. And you know what happens? The Holy Spirit stops him again. And I'm, I, imagine for a moment, you haven't read the whole story. What's going on here? Am I done? Am I washed up? Is, you know, do I just go back to tents full time and, and you know, uh, put aside the pre, what, what does this mean? And then the Spirit of God speaks to him in a dream, telling him to go to Macedonia. That is wisdom. That is, God's got something cooking in Macedonia. And when you read from Acts 16 into 17 into 18, you read about what God does and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and actually the Corinthian church becomes part of that. There's an amazing thing God wants to do in that region. And so God gives him, in a sense, what we would call strategic wisdom for his apostolic campaign that you don't get in a book. You don't get this because you've studied the landscape or anything, you've done the demographics, and you know what's going to happen. You don't do that. Basically, it's the Spirit of God saying, don't go to Asia, don't go to Bithynia. I want you to go to Macedonia. This is not Paul being a wise, kind of a smart guy. This is not wisdom. This is not, that's not, that's not what this is. Later on in the book of Acts, we have another example of this word of wisdom. Again, I'm trying to illustrate that it's not simply a guy who's smart. Paul is on a ship in the Mediterranean. They come under a terrible storm. Uh, so many days they are, they are, they are tossed. The, the ship is tossed to and fro. The sailors are just like, they're like, it's the end. We're, we're, we're done. It's, and they're throwing everything overboard to try to weather this storm. Paul is on the journey. The tent maker preacher. So the tent maker preacher says to the sailors, well into this storm, you know what? Heard from God. Stay with the ship. Nobody leaves the ship and we'll all be, we'll all be fine. Really? Tent maker? Preacher? Um, why don't you get down into the hold and pray? Um, we're seasoned sailors. We, we've been at this and we, we, we're, we have the smarts. We have the wisdom. Paul's got the word of wisdom. The word of wisdom pierces the, the bleakness of the situation, and he says, stay on the ship. Everybody stays on, and God's going to preserve us. And you know what was amazing? They did it. <laughs> That's kind of like part of the miracle, right? They listened to the tent maker preacher who's got this word from heaven. It's wisdom, wisdom that doesn't come because you've sized out the, you know, you, you, you scoped out the, the landscape. I hope you're getting this. Now, it'd be nice to move in that all the time, right? We don't. In other words, in this, in this hour, we experience these gifts of the Spirit in measure. They kind of are dropped into us at times, at strategic moments. I want to share a personal one uh, with you, and then we'll, uh, then we'll wrap up for today. Um, in uh, 19... Boy, it would have been 1978, 79-ish. I was in my third year of public school music teaching. Darlene and I had, were married for about a year. And uh, I had to make a decision on my career, what direction to go with my career. Because uh, back then, I had provisional certification in New York State to teach public school music. And what I had was... Within five years, I had to either get 30 hours of graduate credit or stop teaching. And I wasn't sure what to do. At that time, I, I enjoyed teaching, uh, but I thought, well, maybe, maybe I should get out of teaching and get into music performance, composition, things like that. Um, and I didn't know what to do with my, my career direction. I was really kind of lost. And I would pray, I would pray regularly uh, for God to speak to me. And I, um, 
I'll, I'll just you know share a little bit of my my prayer journey with you. Um, I prayed and prayed and prayed, and God didn't answer. And I prayed and prayed and prayed, and God didn't answer. And I prayed and prayed and prayed, and God didn't answer. And I actually got upset. I started to have a bit of a pity party, um, and a little bit of a, yeah, you'd call it a little bit of a pity party. And I actually remember saying to the Lord, if you're not going to answer, I'm done praying. Almost like I was like, I can give you the silent treatment too. I mean, I, I, silly, I understand. You've never been there. You've never been that frustrated. I was. And I was like, God, I really need to know. I need an answer. And so a few months go by, and I haven't been praying about this with earnestness like I was for quite a season. And so I'm teaching public school music, teaching uh, strings, violin, viola, cello, and bass in Auburn, New York. And uh, I, teach, I taught in different schools. I taught in nine different schools, um, all these different instruments. And one day I'm at one of the elementary schools and I'm, uh, I'm you know, getting one of my classes, my fifth grade beginning violin class prepared. So as was the custom, um, I would have all the kids get their instruments. They would line up in a nice, neat line. I would sit at the piano um, and I would take the violins one by one and tune them. And then they would go back to their chair. Um, so one by one. So I'm tuning a violin, and as I'm tuning the violin, suddenly I remember, oh, I had a dream last night. Oh, it was in like living color, vivid dream. I dreamt about Dr. Pete Popeil, a tuba instructor at the Crane School of Music a brother in the Lord. He was an elder at, at Koinonia Church, now New Hope Church, a great church in Potsdam. And I had known Dr. Popeil because as an undergrad, I, I attended Koinonia Church. And I thought, oh, love Dr. Popeil. What a great brother. And it was just one of these dreams. It was like just remembering it just like, oh, just like warm fuzzies. Like I was home. And I continued to tuned violins and went through my day. The next day, I'm at a different elementary school, another fifth grade class of beginning violinists. They're all in line in a neat single file, and I'm starting to take the violins. I don't know how many violins I was in, and suddenly it was like, oh, I had the same dream last night. Just technicolor. Technicolor, by the way, is a term that I don't know if they still use it anymore. But <laughs> Uh, if the movie was in Technicolor back in the 60s, that was good, uh, just so you know. Um, so I'm like, ah, oh, that was a great Dr. Popeil again. Same dream, same exact dream. I was like, ah, oh. I just thought about Dr. Popeil and meeting him at the church and seeing him at the Crane School of Music in the halls. And I, later on in the day, I thought, that's strange. I don't, I don't get technicolor dreams, first of all. But the same dream, two nights in a row, that I remember mid-morning while I'm tuning violin, something's going on here. I said, you know, I might call Dr. Popeil. Maybe Dr. Popeil has, has some wisdom for me about my future. And so I called Dr. Popeil. I said, Dr. Popeil, you know, we exchanged greetings and kind of uh, updates on our lives. And, uh, and I said, here's why I'm calling. I said, I, I've been struggling with not knowing what to do with my career. He's a Christian, yeah, an elder, elder in the church. At, yeah, uh, he's a believer. Wonder, wonderful brother, um, exemplary. I bumped into him in Walmart two weeks ago. Um, great, great brother. Um, and uh, so uh, I said, you know, I said, I was just calling you because I, I actually had this dream about you two nights in a row, and I didn't know if, if there was some wisdom you might have for me regarding my, my future. And he said, Rick, he said, it's amazing that you would call. He said, I was just appointed temporarily the chairman 
of the graduate admissions department for the Crane School of Music. And he said, I chair the committee that receives the new graduate students. He said, I can't speak for the committee. He said, but I think that the entire committee would want you because of your musical background. We would want you up here. As a matter of fact, he said, I think that if, if I talk to the committee, they'll not only pay your tuition, but they will pay you to come to school. And you'd do some work for the school while you're a student. You'd maybe teach some classes and things. And I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, this is sounding like God. <laughs> this is sounding like God. Now, so I said, well, if, if we could do that, he says, I'll fast track it, get your application in, get your GRE, your graduate record, record exam taken. Uh, so I got that taken care of, did decently on the, on the GRE. They, they, they ended up covering my tuition. They paid me to go to college, so I got money for that. I did some uh, clerical work as well as teaching some things. Um, and I had a wonderful time back at the Crane School of Music getting my master's degree. Now, from there, that's how we ended up in Madrid at Christian Fellowship Center. Complete change of the course of our lives. We were not planning on heading north. We were in central New York, and I had my eyes set on Virginia and places south. <laughs> Wonder why, right. Um, and here we are up north, we get involved first at Crane, then CFC in Madrid, and the Lord says at CFC Madrid in January 1980, you're home, and we've been at home here ever since in the North Country. Now, I'm saying that because this is wisdom we did not have. I did not, as a wise young man, 1979, however old I was, 26, Say, I've got it. I'll leave public school music teaching, do my grad school, take a job as a pastor, stay there for 40 years or so, <laughs> raise a family, plant churches. Oh, yeah, I got it. Got, my career is all mapped out. This guy's amazing. <laughs> None of that. I had no designs in ministry. As a matter of fact, when Tom Wells, a few years later, said, we want to ordain you into the ministry, I said, are you sure? I said, I don't, I don't know if, if, yeah, I'm not sure, brother. Um, I had no designs for ministry. I had no designs for northern New York. I had no, I mean, I love Jesus. I always wanted to be part of a church. But this was wisdom that I did not and could not have had. This was a word of wisdom. Now, it came in the form of dreams and then a, an encounter with a brother that was absolutely appointed by God. He was only the graduate entrance committee chairman for a very short time. After I was admitted, I think about two months later, they replaced him. So this brief window of time, you know, I was frustrated because God wasn't answering earlier, right? Things were, things were in the cooker. You know, there, there's things in the cooker in our lives. You, you know, the cake is in the oven. You can't take it up. You, don't get frustrated that it's not ready. It's just not ready. And so this is a word of wisdom. I'm sharing this because this is not because I stand back now and say, you know, I just, I had a, I had a plan for my life, folks. I used to be so intimidated as a college student because I'd talk with other college students that would tell me their plans for their lives. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And, uh, you know, I, I met one guy who had a 10-year plan. I was like, I don't have a 10-minute plan. Um, how, do, how do you have a 10-year plan? I'm like, so, I'm just such a flop. I'm a failure. I'm a person. I just, like, I, I, just, I, just, I just have no value. I'm thinking when I'm around these people, I have no plans. I don't have that kind of wisdom. This is a word of wisdom from heaven. Now, I don't just have a master's degree. You know what I have? I have a testimony. We don't walk away from these operations of the gift of the Spirit simply with some wisdom or some knowledge or even a healing, as great as that is, we walk away with a testimony that God was at work. God, Psalm 46, God is in her midst. God is in her midst. And so the operation of the Spirit is meant to build us. 
We all get to be part of it. I've only talked about one of the nine gifts. Um, we'll talk, I don't know what we'll do next week, and then we're into the book of Acts. We will cover this all in its fullness eventually. Um, I'll, I'll pray about the best way for us to do it. But saints, I want you to recognize that God wants you right where you are, young in the Lord, seasoned in the Lord, to be operating the gifts of the Spirit, to be hungry for Him. One of the things we will talk about is the baptism with the Holy Spirit. I believe the baptism with the Holy Spirit, speaking with tongues, it's like the starting point. So I want to encourage you to be asking the Lord, if you're not sure if you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, begin to say, Jesus, baptize me. Baptize me. One of the things I want to say about that is in the New Testament, the book of Acts, when people were filled with the Holy Spirit, and I think I mentioned this last week, they knew it. In other words, there was, they had an awareness that the Holy Spirit had touched them. I want to encourage you to have that expectation for God to touch you, to fill you, and start using you in some amazing ways. I'll talk more about our testimony. Again, if you could catch the Facebook Live, I think it'd be good because Darlene and I are covering some things we probably won't cover, cover here on Sunday morning or Wednesday nights. But I want you to be hungry. The Apostle Paul gets into this three-chapter segment. Again, I used the term before. It's a lot of New Testament real estate. It really is. Three chapters on any one thing in the New Testament, it's big, okay? Um, and so there's very few things like that in the New Testament. This is very, very significant. I want us to recognize that this is significant, that God's plan is for all his kids to move in the power of the Spirit. What Jesus moved in, in the fullness of grace, we see in the apostle and those who were part of that first wave of believers, but then we see it in the waves that follow, and the plan is that it would be for all who are far off until the Lord our God comes back, as many as he would call. I want you to be hungry for the operation of the Holy Spirit in your life personally, but also in our midst and in our world. Imagine bringing words of wisdom, words of knowledge, healings, miracles to the, to the world around us. I mean, God, God on the move. Jesus with the woman at the well, reading her mail. I mean, that changed her life, her destiny. And really, that was a, an amazing time because the whole town really was, uh, was deeply moved by what happened there. God wants to move. And it's going to take something that's more than me power and you power. It's the Spirit of God that's going to reach the world around us that is hopelessly broken. And yet, the Master Builder delights to take that which is broken and to redeem it, to make it better. Let's stand together. Gabe, could you come up and maybe lead us in a chorus of your choosing? And I want you to pray a simple prayer today. That prayer is, Holy Spirit, come and fill me. And whatever your past experience has been, whether it's just maybe scratching the surface, maybe it's been some deep encounters, today is a day for a fresh encounter. Today's a day for a deepening of the work of the Spirit of God in our lives. Jesus said, if we, in our brokenness, being evil, if we know how to give good gifts to our kids, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? Holy Spirit, would you fill us? Holy Spirit, would you move? Holy Spirit, would you be present in the daily living? Would you be present in and through us? as we interact with our spouses. Lord, not just, not just us, but the Spirit of God in operation, equipping, building, strengthening. As we interact with our parents, our children, Holy Spirit in operation. Holy Spirit gifts popping up here and there. Prophetic words for our sons and daughters, prophetic words for our moms and dads. Prophetic words for our co-workers. Father, I pray that you would just, just in a sense, fill us, saturate us like never before. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come.
There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare your our living hope. Your presence, Lord. And I've tasted and seen. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of love when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord, your presence, Lord. I sing there's nothing with more. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. Sing, I've tasted and seen.
Lord's presence, if you would. I want you to lift your hands right now. Signifying a couple of things. First of all, surrender, but also a pursuit. A surrender and a pursuit. Where our lives belong to you, we surrender them. But Lord, we pursue you today. We want you. We reach out for you today. Lord, I pray today that you would move us from the observer's seat to a seat of actively pursuing you in a fresh way. How much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? To them that ask. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Luke chapter 11. The writer of the gospel and the writer of the book of Acts declaring with certainty the Father's intention to bless those who ask. A wholehearted pursuit. Lord, we reach out to you today. And Lord, I pray, I pray that the coming seven days, I pray it would be significant. God, we, we ask you today, would you pour out your spirit? Lord, I pray that there would be a, 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 a sprinkling, so to speak, a, a rain of your spirit splashing of the Spirit in different ways, just, just impacting us unexpectedly at times. Unexpectedly, God just speaking, kind of intersecting us, invading our thoughts, interrupting the ordinaries of life. Lord, we ask today, and I pray for the power of the Holy Spirit, us to touch, to bless, to encourage, to share, to, to, to just be active, agents of God, commissioned, fully deputized to bring the message of the kingdom of heaven to those around us. Even during COVID, Lord, your work is greater than, and so we pray, would you minister? you to put those hands down and I want you to make I want you to make a commitment right now not to me but in a sense to the Lord that you're going to spend a little time this week just in his presence really trying to talk to him and really listen to his heart I think a lot of times when we think about our lives as believers, we, and particularly even the Word of God in preaching, we think about information. But the Lord wants transformation. It says about the early believers that those who rubbed shoulders with them took note that they had been with Jesus. The difference maker was time in his presence the impact of the Lord so I want to encourage you to take some time and expect the Holy Spirit to touch you expect the Holy Spirit to fill you expect the Holy Spirit to refresh you thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus and right now I just there's a there's a lie that sometimes the enemy puts on us. It's not for me, it's for others. Uh -uh. Peter proclaimed in Acts 2, it's for you, your children, and to all those who are far off. And we're far off in space and time, and it's for us. Lord, I pray for a great, great week. Amen. Amen.
Saints, God bless you. Um, I'm excited. We're going to see God on the move. If you would, mask up, and we'll continue to visit with one another.